Hi and hello. Welcome to another session of Beginner's Bible Discovery. Now, I know uh, the plan was to look at Romans 1 today. However, I've decided to yield to the leading of the Holy Spirit. Sometimes it's like that. He diverts us a bit. We've made detours before, I know, but I've decided I'm going to be sensitive to the moving of the Spirit. So after this week, I found that it would have been useful if I were to detour a little bit and revisit. We touched on it a little bit in the past, but revisit in a little more detail the Godhead. You know, as new Christians, you're learning. And of course, one of the things you would want to learn about is God. Who is God? Being able to see what God says about himself. And I mean, since we have to share and we're required to speak to others and give a reason for our faith, as the scripture says, you, you can't do that unless you know something. You can articulate things, you know. Being able to describe something doesn't necessarily mean you know it inside out, but at least it's a learning process, you know, and you have to make an effort to learn, right? Okay, so I want us to start off by looking at a short scripture reference. All right, so let's look at Acts chapter 17. Just gonna look at a couple of verses here to kind of kick off, right? Acts chapter 17, we take it up from verse 16, right? So it says here, now while Paul waited for them at Athens, Athens, as in Greece, it's still named Athens in Greece, the capital, right? Now, while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was stirred in him when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. Now, if you are familiar with Greek mythology, you know they teach that in schools in many places, you would understand what, what Paul was faced with in that place, right? What we study as Greek mythology with the many gods, everything, everywhere has a god or a goddess. That was their actual religion in these times when Paul was there. So, ooh, quite a scene for him, a Jew. Yeah. Therefore, disputed he in the synagogue with the Jews and with the devout persons and in the market daily with them that met him. Of course, in the book of Acts, we're speaking about Paul's missionary journeys. So, of course, he was in Athens to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he had a way when he got to a city, he would go first to the synagogues, the Jews, and well, to other people, of course. Now, verse 18. Let's have a look at this. Then certain philosophers of the Epicureans and of the Stoics encountered him. And some said, what will this babbler see? Other some, he seemeth to be a set of forth of strange gods, because he preached unto them Jesus and the resurrection. Now, very interesting considering Epicureans and Stoics. These people have you know, a large pantheon of gods, as I said, right? A lot of idolatry very polytheistic. And I imagine you gods pop up all the time, other people, oh, look, this God here of this, and there's a God there of that, you know. So when they talk about a set of what are strange gods, I don't think it's just a matter of new gods because they are accustomed to new gods, I would think, you know. But strange as in strange, as in, different and look so much so they refer to Paul as a babbler because man what are you talking about what he has to share is unlike anything 
they have heard, and you would think, if you're familiar at all with Greek mythology, you would think they've heard it all. What he's sharing is very boggles their minds, Epicureans and Stoics. These are, you know, like philosopher type people or whatever, right? And they call him a babbler because he sounds like a babbler because mm, not following Paul, not following. What are you talking about? And this is the thing. The true God, this God with whom we have to do, as the scripture says, as Christians, stands alone, very much unlike any other God. Many things about him, different, 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 and different in a way that sometimes when we talk about him, the lost are like, Okay, what are you talking about? Are you crazy? And we sound like babblers to them because it's so different, the message of the gospel and everything about this God. Some would claim similarities to this God, but no, 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 no. None can match and compare to this God. So I just thought, you know, I would start off on this note you know, because of what we have to get into now, right? Now, I refer to that scripture to drive this point home. Now, it's my firm belief that we are not expected to comprehend God. Hmm. Can you figure out why? <laughs> You're not really expected to comprehend, to intellectually conquer God. And that's the problem with a lot of the non-believers. They expect certain things. And then when we speak to them about the Lord and they're hearing what's strange to them, or they have difficulty with what they're hearing, especially the more intellectual types, because they're accustomed to just getting everything, they have problems. But the truth is, we're not expected to comprehend. What are we expected to do? To be informed of, and more than that, to believe, right? Having all the information is one thing. Believe what he has revealed to us. And we're fortunate that we have a complete Bible. It's been all written down for us. We know that in the past, Jews and early Christians, everything wasn't written for them. They had to function without everything being written down for them. We have it available, written down for us in a nice compact book in our phones and our tablets even. Anyway, right? So what is our responsibility? to be informed of. Read the Bible to know what's in it, pretty much, and believe what is revealed, what is revealed. So I pulled out a little bit of what is revealed. Of course, I can't talk about everything that's revealed, but you know, snippets, glimpses at what is revealed so that we can be informed of and believe what we should about God. All right, so let's dive right in. Let's dive right in. Okay, so it says here, before the mountains were brought forth, or ever thou hadst formed the earth, and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. Mm. From everlasting to everlasting, that type of language says, unbound by time, eternity. And eternity when, in particular, before the mountains, eternity, before there was time, 
before anything was created, before what's written down in Genesis 1. Well, in the beginning, actually, speaks about this, eternity past. In the beginning, the word beginning implies time starts here. So before, thou art God. Let's look at another scripture. But thou Bethlehem Ephrata, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee he, hmm, he shall come forth unto me, that is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting. Right, so this is from Micah, one of the prophets of the Old Testament. So from the time we see things like Bethlehem and then Israel, it's a prophet. We know that this is prophecy. And Bethlehem and ruler in Israel, when we put it together, who, who is this prophecy about? Jesus Christ, right? And how is Jesus Christ described? His goings forth have been from of old, as far back, how far back? Everlasting. Everlasting, the same everlasting we see here, which was eternity before creation. Hmm. All right, let's... Let's read on, let's read on, right? Let's see what else is revealed. Right, so bearing in mind what we just saw, let's look at some more scriptures. Let's look at what else is revealed. It says here, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God. See the preposition they use, and the word was God. The same, the same, meaning the word, right, was in the beginning, right? And as we saw in a previous lesson, right, in the beginning, John 1, John opens his gospel account mirroring Genesis 1, right, in the beginning. The same was in the beginning with God. So we just saw scriptures talking about God from everlasting to everlasting being God, eternity before creation, before there were people and angels and stars and whatnot to worship him, he was God. And then we saw the prophecy about Jesus and he is being described as being from everlasting. Mm. So here, so we're talking about the word with God and was God. The same meaning the word was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him and without him was not anything made that was made. Now again, we have looked at this scripture comparing Genesis one with John one. And we know that further down in chapter one, we see who the word is if you're not sure. Right, the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, Jesus Christ. So the word here is Jesus. And what, what do we see? Just reiterate what we saw in Micah. Because Jesus, as we saw in Micah, his goings forth were from everlasting. Jesus is from eternity, past. And well, eternity, there's no past or future, but you know what I mean, right? The same was in the beginning with God. So Jesus was at, okay, time starts here, and Jesus was already there with God. And not just with God, was God. Hmm, interesting. All right, let's look at what else is revealed. For I am God, and there is none else. I am God. There is none like me. Well, we kind of touched on that before. There's none like unto the one true God, none like unto him. 
I am God, there is none else. I am God, there is none like me. Now look at this. Interesting. Speaking about Jesus, Colossians 1 says, who is the image of the invisible God? But hold on. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. You just said there is none like you. And now you're talking about the image of. So if Jesus is the image of God and God said there is none like him, clearly again, what is revealed? Jesus is God. Image of God is like God. An image of something is something like it, you yeah. know, right? The firstborn of every creature, right? For by him were all things created that are in heaven. And just to be clear, just to be clear, for by him all things were created. And then it goes on to, <laughs> you know, explain. Just to be clear what we're talking about all, because you see this word, this word can cause some of us problems sometimes you use all. So just to be clear, all as in everybody and everything in heaven, everybody and everything in earth, visible or invisible, anything like thrones, dominions, principalities, anything, anything, all things were created by him, by him, it is who is created by him and for him. And he is before all things and by him all things consist. So if he is before all things, if he is before all things, don't let anybody trip you up with this freezing. Right, this is going here. Because if he is before all things, what does that mean? To be before all. What's a good all mean? All things. And by him, all things consist. So this is what is revealed. This is what is revealed. Hmm. All right, so let's just kind of recap a little bit what has been revealed so far, based on what we've looked at. God and the word, who was made clear, Jesus Christ, are juxtaposed, right? The use of that preposition with, the word was with God. Juxtaposed, is this a vocabulary test for you? <laughs> God and Jesus are juxtaposed, put side by side. Isn't that what's been revealed? Isn't that what we read? I'm just saying what has been revealed, what we saw. Beginning word was with God. Juxtaposed, right? And the other scriptures in Micah that talk about Jesus being from everlasting. Hmm. And then we talk about none being like God, but then Jesus is the image of God, i.e. Jesus is like God. And when we talk about image in another place, it talks about express image is like, you know, look in a mirror, but of course the big difference when you and I look in a mirror, we see an image that looks like us, but that image doesn't exist. You learn that in science class. However, <laughs> when God comes face to face with his image, that image definitely exists, right? Because that image created everything. Mm -hmm -hmm. All right, what else do we see here? The writing, right?
All right, so the writing of the Bible is its revelation to man. Because you know, the word that we just saw is written in the Bible. So we have the embodied word, which is Jesus Christ, the incarnate word. And then well, the written word is what we're talking about here. So the writing of the Bible is its revelation to man, not its production. So over these thousands of years that the Bible has been given to us by men who wrote as they were moved by the Holy Ghost, as we saw in earlier lessons, it wasn't just being made up as we went along. It was already established, but only just being handed to us, revealed to us bit by bit. As I said, over a few thousand years, several authors, from several walks of life, from different places. It's the revelation. It's not a production because we just saw that the word was already existing in eternity past before creation, right? The words of God also pre-existed creation. Hmm. Jesus is eternal. Hopefully that's clear by now, based on what is revealed in scriptures we just looked at. Jesus Christ is in fact eternal as in, he has always been since before the creation of every single person or thing that exists before time, just like God, Jesus Christ was there. Jesus Christ is ubiquitous, just like God, as we said, that by him, all things consist. He made all things and by him, all things consist just like God. Now, I didn't say that Jesus Christ is in everything and God is in everything. That, that's, ugh, let's be careful. But by him, all things consist. He presides over and makes sure everything holds together. You know, we know that there's some people, all that we will see in Romans 1, where it speaks about people who think that everything holds itself together. Mm, no, 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 no. Jesus Christ is eternal, hence not created in any form or fashion. He cannot be. If he's God, he's not created. If he's God, he's not created. That doesn't compute according to what is revealed because God is not created in any shape or form. Now, again, again, remember, <laughs> we started out by saying, we are not expected to comprehend, but to just know what is revealed and not just know, know and believe what is revealed. Because of course, from where we are as humans, from where we sit looking at all of this, words, uh, wind. <laughs> well, we can, most of us will, okay, we'll accept that God's words is a little more than wind, right? God's, wi God's words does things, you know? Right, creation, for example, as we just saw. But what has been revealed to us? God's words is a person. We can't begin to fathom that because that's not the case with us at all. God's words, God's word, words, a person who is also God. So, okay, God's words is a person. 
So you think in your mind, you know, agents and agents, you know, under the total control, mutable agents under the total control of God. But that's not what's revealed because God can be handled like that. So we see a juxtaposition and in order to have a juxtaposition, we need to have more than one person. See, I'm using my choosing, trying to choose my words carefully. In order to juxtapose, you need to have more than one. See, I'm more than one person juxtapose. And both persons are God. So that means neither of them are mutable. When God speaks, God does things. God creates by speaking. And God's words are a person. Who is God? Hence, <laughs> not mutable. Mm -hmm. We are not expected to comprehend. We are expected to be informed of what is revealed and believe it. Now, I, I would say myself and other Christians who have been Christians a while, Mm, I'll use the word comfortable. I will articulate this. Okay, this is how it is. All right, fine. Again, human understanding. This is this this boggles the mind. But you know what? If it was very straightforward and simple, and any human could intellectually conquer this God, then you know a human made this God. But what we're dealing with here is revelation revelation so we follow in the path of the revelation what is in the scripture and that's what we're seeing here <laughs> all right there's more let's move along all right so aha uh -huh. let's look at these scriptures here genesis from the beginning so from the get-go genesis one Ooh, off the bat god said let us make man in our image oh let us make man in our image. Interesting. Uh huh. Let us make man in our image. And the Lord God said, Behold, the man is become as one of us to know good and evil. And the Lord said, Go to, let us go down. And there confound their language. Now, this one in particular here. The holy man has become as one of us, to no good and evil, one of us. So that means the us in question knows good and evil. Hold on to that. The us. We know good and evil, and the man has become as us as one of us and the us no good and evil what are we seeing here we are seeing god speaking in the first person plural hmm. okay all right so more scripture here what else is revealed what's revealed here or israel the lord our god same Lord God that we just saw in the previous slide. The Lord our God is one Lord. But we just saw us. Okay. Over here, for there are three that bear record in heaven. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And guess what? Uh -huh. These three are one. So the us we were seeing on the previous slide, the us is three. So that us, the three of us. So let us, let the three of us make man, let the three of us go down and confuse their language. The holy man has become as one of the three of us. And the three of us know good and evil. Hold on to that. Though. 
point. We'll come back to that later on. We're looking at what is revealed. Let's recap a bit. What is revealed? What is revealed? God is singular and plural at the same time. How many? Three, we say persons, but one God. Isn't that what has been revealed? The scriptures we just looked at a few seconds ago. That's what has been revealed. God is singular and plural at the same time. Now, you and I learn in English class that singular is singular and plural is plural. Never would we imagine that singular and plural go together. And you can be singular and plural at the same time. Well, yeah. God, nobody else. God is singular and plural at the same time. Now, we looked at this before. Right. I realize what I have prepared. This is going to be in parts, right? So I don't have time. But, oh gosh, I don't want to sound like that. I have more to share, so I'm not going to spend time repeating what we discussed already. If you haven't watched these videos that we we did, the three witnesses in heaven. So the title alone tells you what we're going to deal with there. Especially that first John 5, 7. Yes, before this sentence, before you finish that sentence, we dealt with this in the three witnesses in heaven. This is first John 5, 7. Manufactured, quite frankly, that's how I see it. This manufactured conundrum with first John 5, 7. We dealt with that in the three witnesses in heaven. Touched on this in Genesis 1b, because as you see, straight off the bat in Genesis. This is revealed, right? And judgment, Sodom and Gomorrah, we see it coming up again when we dealt with that lesson dealing with Sodom and Gomorrah, right? So, you know, I would advise, of course, I can't tell anybody what to do and make anybody do anything, but you know, I would advise that you go to those three Right, because as I said, I wouldn't spend time repeating all that we said in those three videos about this God as three in one. But we see here that this is what is revealed. God is singular and plural at the same time. Plural as in three of them. Three persons, but one God. So we are monotheistic because it's one God. We are not polytheistic because it's one God. Is three persons in one God. Each of us, well, I will say this and then move on. As humans, again, if you're using human, <laughs> human capacity to try to grapple with it, you know to yourself you are one human and one person. You are one and one and one and one. Well, God is three and one and one and three. This is what has been revealed. I don't think our brains are wired to, as I say, intellectually conquer this, but we do have the capacity to be informed because it's been revealed, right? It's in our Bibles, we read it. As I just read those passages that show us this, right? And to believe it. And believe it, it, yes, this topic is a big deal because of the implications. If Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit are not persons of the Godhead, there are serious implications to that. There are serious implications to that. Right, so as a Christian, this is the fundamental, this is, this is, 
foundation stuff here. If this is not laid well, and this isn't solid, and your beliefs aren't built on this, the implications are not great, right? I'll say that. All right, moving along, there's more to see. All right, so what else has been reviewed? Let's look at these scripture here, let's look at this. And Moses said unto God, behold, when I come to the children of Israel and shall say unto them, the God of your fathers hath sent me unto you. And they shall say to me, what is his name? What shall I say unto them? And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, thus shall thou see unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent me unto you. So this is what is revealed. What is God's name? I am that I am. Well, yes, because didn't we just see that God is from everlasting to everlasting before creation. And of course, he's going to be everlasting going forward. He just is. He's not bound by time. He existed, but well, he exists outside of time. He made time and put us in it. But he, before us, existed outside of time. He still exists outside of time. And he will always exist outside of time. So grandma will have him in perpetual present tense. I am that I am. I'm the one that just is. I just, I just am. You know, right? So just tell them the I am, the self-existent one. Again, pretty much setting himself apart from other gods because at this time, there were other gods about the place, right? If you don't recognize this, this is Moses in Egypt, right? So the Jews are in Egypt, in bondage in Egypt. And you know, Egypt was also very polytheistic with many gods. People still into that type of thing now, Egyptology. Uh, Isis and who and who and who, Horus. And, uh, uh, people still study that type of thing, the pyramids, all of that. So they had their pantheon of gods. They were also pagan, polytheistic. So the Jews, I mean, that wasn't their culture and God forbid them from adhering to those gods, but they were exposed. So again, this is of course gonna come across strange to them too, because this God is different to everybody else. He just is, just tell them the I am sent you. So this is what is revealed. That God's name is I am, All right? Just go with that, okay? So what else is revealed? Let's have another glimpse here at the scriptures. So I need to learn wisdom. This is a man speaking, right? Person that wrote, right? Proverbs 30. I need to learn wisdom. No have knowledge of the holy. Knowledge of the holy. So who's the holy? Look at this. Who has ascended up into heaven or descended? So when he talks about the holy, when we're talking about the holy, it's the one who had ascended up to heaven or descended. Okay. Who hath gathered the wind in a space? Who hath bound the waters in a garment? Who hath established all the ends of the earth? Now look at this, interesting. What is his name? What is his son's name? If thou canst tell. So this person is contemplating. I need a little wisdom and knowledge of the holy. But in his mind, if we're talking about God at all, we're talking about God. And there's a son. Now, this is Proverbs, right? The Old Testament before Isaiah and all the prophets who focused on the coming of Jesus. Interesting that this person, you see, again, as we said in a previous lesson, in the Old Testament, they would be talking about whatever they're talking about. But when you take a second look, you realize, hey, they're prophesying. They may or may not have realized it sometimes. 
like this person. Eh, this is prophecy here. What is his name? What is his son's name? So again, what do we see? Persons, a plurality, one God, but a plurality about him too. Juxtaposition. What is his name? What is his son's name? Well, okay. Let's get that question answered. Yes, the answers were revealed. And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, which what we just read, right? Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am, had sent you. What is his name? I am. Okay. Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am. Now note the reaction. Then they took up stones to stone him. Why? Why would Jews, she was speaking to Jews and you know, Jewish leaders and whoever. Why would they take up stones to stone him? Blasphemy. Blasphemy. Because he said he's the I am. So what is his name? I am. What is his son's name? I am. Now, yes, the I am's look a little different. Up here, this is from the Old Testament Hebrew scripture. This I am is from one of the titles the Jews had in Hebrew for God, right? New Testament written in Greek. What's written is a little bit different. It's not this Jewish title. It's I believe there's something a little different written here, but it says the same thing, you know, right? I believe it's a language transition, that, but it's the same because look at the reaction. So they knew exactly, they didn't misunderstand him at all. They knew what Jesus was saying. He identified himself as the I am. So again, again, let's backtrack a little bit. Jesus Christ is God. Right? And if he's God, he's immutable, he's uninitiated, he's uncreated. He's his own person. He's not just an agent. Saying that he's a mutable agent, that God shapes and forms to perform things because he's a word. A sensible human <laughs> conclusion, yes. But again, what is revealed? Because what we've read mm, doesn't really line up with that. What we've seen so far, what has been revealed, right? So we're dealing with what is being revealed. That's what we're dealing in. All right, so more revelation. Uh -huh. It says here, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, mm -hmm. the Everlasting Father, oh goodness me, the Prince of Peace. Again, this is. Prophecy. And who are they prophesying about? Child is born, nah, every Christmas, nah, Jesus Christ, right? So Jesus Christ is wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting father. Now, oh dear, Jesus Christ's son <laughs> is referred to here as the everlasting father. Everlasting. Again, he's eternal and the everlasting father. All right, let's 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 read on. What else is revealed? Now, for the sake of space, of course, you can go to these references and read them fully. I just pulled out the point. So the remnants of Israel shall stay upon the Lord. Anytime we see the Lord in the Bible, it means God. It's referring to God. Again another Jewish title or something, right? So this is God, stay upon the Lord, the Holy One, the Holy One and all caps. So that tells you this is God, 
of Israel in truth. So who is the Holy One? The Lord, God, God, the Holy One. The remnants shall return. As I said, read in context, these are Jews who survived some horrible things that happened to the Jewish nation. Anyway, so the remnants shall return, even the remnants of Jacob unto the mighty God. Well, yeah, if we weren't sure, just in case if we weren't sure. So Isaiah prophesies about Jesus Christ being the child that's born, the son that's given. And one of the names Isaiah, prophesying is that he's the mighty God. This is Jesus up here, right? This is Jesus up here. And we're talking about the Lord who is God, who's the mighty God. So Jesus is the mighty God. Again, if we haven't gotten it yet, this is what's revealed, we see it again. Okay, moving on, another scripture. For in him, we're talking about Jesus Christ here, in Colossians, right? For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead, bodily, bodily, at this point, Paul is telling the Christians in Colossians about Jesus, incarnated Jesus, when he was a man on earth for 30 something odd years. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead. Godhead, again, we saw this in previous video about Godhead. Godhead, what we know as Trinity. Godhead is another word for Trinity. So as we discussed in the video, people say, oh, the Trinity is not in the Bible. Well, yeah, it is. Godhead. The word Godhead. So once the word Godhead is in your Bible, and I know it's in mine, indeed the Trinity, and the word Trinity is in the Bible, Godhead, right? What else is revealed? The first man, meaning Adam, again, this is 1 Corinthians 15, 47, where Paul is comparing Adam with Jesus. So the first man, well, Adam was the first man on earth, right? The first man is of the earth, earth. The second man is who? The Lord from heaven. The second man is the Lord from heaven. When you see Lord in the New Testament, it tends to be like this. And Lord in the Old Testament, sometimes you see it like that, right? The second man is the Lord from heaven, Jesus Christ. The Lord. The Lord from heaven, All right? Next scripture, Jesus is saying, behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit hath not flesh and bones as he see me have, right? So this is Jesus right at the end of the gospel of Luke after his resurrection. I mean, if you know you, witness a death and went to a funeral a few days ago and the person you know you're buried is coming in. Hi, how are you going? Oh, uh, uh, ghost. Yeah, no. Flesh and bones as you see me have. He, he rose. He rose from the dead. And I put this here because again, he put on a human body and he was real flesh and real bones and had real blood because to save us, he had to be wounded in real flesh. He had to bleed real blood. He had to die and raise again. So I put this here, I just threw this in here to show that Jesus indeed was in the form was a man, was in the form of a man for a while, although he was, as we see, the mighty God and had the fullness of the Godhead and was the Lord from heaven. Mm -hmm. 